20. Vows and Oaths As we have seen, both church and state have claimed too much. They have arrogated to themselves powers reserved either to God or by God to other orders of life. Moreover, they have been guilty of theft, claiming more than is their own. The state's taxing power has become theft. It is not the God-appointed head tax, but is now the equivalent of four and a half tithes. The church has claimed the tithe as her own, refusing to admit that the priest's portion is only one-tenth of the basic tithe. Numbers chapter 18, verses 21 to 28. One of the areas of arrogant claims to power is the vow and the oath. A central problem also is the confusion of these two very distinct things and more than a little misunderstanding as a result. First of all, with respect to the oath, Thompson's definition is to the point. An oath is the invocation of a curse upon one if he breaks his word, 1 Samuel 19 verse 6, or if he is not speaking the truth, Mark 14 verse 71. In the Institutes of Biblical Law, we have seen that, where the truth is being extracted from us for evil purposes, for the commission of a crime, we are under no obligation to tell the truth. To tell the truth and help an evildoer in the commission of a crime is to become an accessory to it. Moreover, another factor appears in our Lord's declaration in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. Again, we have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Thompson's comment on this is not admissible, since it is dispensational. In the kingdom of God, oaths will finally become unnecessary. Matthew chapter 5, verses 34 to 37. There is no warrant in the text for postponing any obedience to our Lord's words. Moreover, in James chapter 5, verse 12, we have this commandment restated. But, above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. The word communication in Matthew chapter 5 verse 37 has reference to a spoken word, to conversation, and hence it is clear that oaths are forbidden insofar as conversation is concerned. They are reserved for formal legal testimony. Christ himself testified under oath. Matthew chapter 26 verses 63 and 64. St. Paul makes a religious use of the oath in his epistles to confirm his word to the churches. Romans chapter 1 verse 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 31, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23, Galatians chapter 1 verse 20, Philippians chapter 1 verse 8, to whom he wrote as the Apostle of Christ. What is thus clearly forbidden by our Lord is the use of oaths in conversation. Such oaths violate the third commandment. They take the name of the Lord in vain. Exodus chapter 20 verse 7. Vain oaths were condemned by Christ. Matthew chapter 23 verses 16 to 24. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, 
Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold. And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing. But whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it, and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God, and by him that sitteth thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 to 24. Such vain swearing puts the emphasis on man and man's integrity rather than on God and the certainty of his curse for false swearing. The emphasis in the example cited by our Lord of the casuistry of the Pharisees is on man's gift, not God's rule and realm, on the gold, not the temple, on the gift brought by man to the altar rather than the altar itself. On the heavens generally, not God directly, so that God is avoided and an aspect of creation is stressed. The examples of false tithing are brought in to illustrate a basic premise in such false swearing. In Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 17, corn, wine and oil are specified as subject to the law of the tithe, that is, the field crops not the garden products like mint, anise and cumin. What we have is thus what Ellicott's termed, the substitution of the lower for the higher. The result is a false holiness, one which claims great sensitivity because it tithes mint and swears by the gift on the altar, but is in reality only straining at gnats to gain a reputation for sanctity while carelessly swallowing camels that is, disregarding the weightier matters of the law. The legitimate oath, thus, is to serve godly, not ungodly purposes, is restricted to civil and ecclesiastical purposes, and must be in the name of God. The third commandment clearly requires us to take the oath seriously. Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12 declares, and ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. The second half of this statement restates the first half, but not in mere repetition, but by development. A false oath is forbidden where God's name is involved. We should note that the law reads, By my name. The modern oath is godless. The court requires in many states that we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, merely on our affirmation and the court's demand. Such a court has placed itself and its oaths outside of God, and they are thus lies to begin with. The Christian in such a court does swear, whether the court language includes it or not, by God, not by man because he can recognise no other oath as anything but blasphemy. On the other hand, a godless court which still retains God in its oath is also guilty of taking the Lord's name in vain. An oath is God-centred. If states and or church depart from God, their use of the oath in any way is profanity. They do not believe in God's judgments or curse only in man's and 
Their use of the oath is thus false usage. The godless oath is a personal affirmation in the name of the state. It is swearing by a false god, clearly forbidden in Scripture. Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 16, Amos chapter 8 verse 14. Perjury required the same penalty as in the case involved. The penalty against the accused would be the penalty against the false witness for or against him. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 to 21. Second, whereas the oath is in the name of God to an agency of justice established by God, the vow is directly to God. Thus, neither oaths nor vows are to individuals. Our speech to men must be yea, yea, and nay, nay, straightforward and truthful. Because we are servants of God, we cannot be the servants of men. We cannot bind ourselves to men by a careless word. To illustrate, I once urged a man not to get involved in a situation where trouble between myself and another man was developing. I felt it was none of his concern to make a stand on either side. He promised to stay out, but subsequently changed his mind for reasons best known to himself and stood against me. He was distressed at breaking his word to me and went to great lengths to justify himself. My opinion was that no such self-justification was needed. I had no power to bind him, nor any right to, nor did I ask nor could I ask for an unconditional commitment. Only God can require an unconditional commitment from us, and even God puts limitations on our power to commit ourselves by a vow. In Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 to 16, this is very clear. We have here case law, cases which illustrates a general premise by applying it to a concrete situation. A vow is a pledge to perform certain things. Genesis chapter 28 verses 20 to 22 or to abstain from certain things. Psalm 132 verses 2 to 5. Either in return for God's blessing, Numbers chapter 21 verses 1 to 3, or in devotion to God, Psalm chapter 22 verse 25. First of all, in making a vow to God, a man shall not break his word, he shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Numbers chapter 30, verses 1 and 2. This unconditional and binding vow can only be vowed by a free man who is not subject to any authority with power to command him contrary to his vow. This means second that persons' independent positions cannot make binding vows if the authority over them disallows the vow. This is illustrated in four cases involving women. A. An unmarried woman, living with her family and thus under her father's authority. B. An unmarried woman who makes a vow but marries before she can keep her vow. C. A widow or a divorced woman. And D. A married woman. The daughter's vow is binding if the father, on hearing it, is silent and does not disallow it. If he disallows the vow, it is not in force. The same applies to the vow of the married woman if her husband's position is favourable or unfavourable to her vow. When a young woman marries, the husband can allow or disallow her vow made while single, but Again, only at the time he hears of it, not at a later date. Every vow of a divorced woman or of a widow is binding because they are not under authority. Thus, God will not allow a vow to be used to create disunity or an escape from authority within a family. The vow cannot be a promise to give God what is already his due, such as the tithe, Leviticus chapter 27, verse 26. 
No tax due to God is thus a gift to him. It is already his rightful possession. Moreover, nothing which is the income of sin can be used to pay a vow. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, or the price of a dog, a homosexual, into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow, for even both these are abomination unto the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 18. Moreover, to give God a substitute and blemished gift for the gift vowed is to incur his curse. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 13. No vow can be used to deceive God, nor to make God's law null and void. As our Lord made clear, no vow or gift to God can nullify the requirements of the law. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Albeit in vain do they worship me, teachings for doctrines the commandments of men. For, laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such like things do ye. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honour thy father and thy mother, and Whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effects through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do you. Mark chapter 7, verses 6 to 13. For any man to evade his duty to his parents by giving instead to the sanctuary was, in God's sight, a cursing of his parents and a flagrant denial of God's law. It is thus clearly condemned. Vows do not set aside the law. Marriage vows to God are thus not unconditional, They are subject to the law of God, and violations of God's law by one partner frees the other. Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 to 4, Matthew chapter 19 verses 3 to 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verses 10 to 15. There is no special virtue in vowing nor in abstaining from vows. When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 1 to 23. The vow made by a free person is binding before God and must be paid. Because oaths are made in the name of God to a God-ordained agency, and because vows are made directly to God, neither church nor state can regard either as in any way binding men to them rather than to God's law. No disobedient and faithless church can regard its clergy and laity as bound to loyalty to the institution, and no lawless state can bind the conscience of men apart from the word of God. The framework of reference in oaths and vows cannot be humanistic. Clearly, vows are not unconditional, nor are oaths permitted unless they are God-centred. No vow can be turned into a means of evading God's law or of setting aside God-ordained human authority in its legitimate claims. The oath invokes a curse for breaking one's word or for deceit. The vow also invokes a curse on failure to render unto God what has been promised him. The essence of a curse is that it is a judgment on sin. No oath 
or vow can thus be used to further a sin, to set aside a godly authority, or to evade a godly responsibility. The purpose of the oath and the vow is to further the kingdom of God and his righteousness, never to hinder it. In brief, a man's word must be bigger than a man. That is, it must have a framework of reference greater than man, marriage, church or state. Its framework must be the kingdom of God and his righteousness.